So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Jean Kupperman from Northeastern University. I am Greg Malevich uh, from Upper Team. Uh, Professor Kupperman has worked on uh, uh, high performance computing and uh, he will give a talk about his uh, recent uh, research results. Uh, with that, thank you. <coughs> Hi. So, uh, as you see, uh, I'm uh, uh, running the High Performance Computing Laboratory at Northeastern University. These are uh, six of my PhD students who are also working on various aspects of this effort. Um, so, when uh, Greg invited me to uh, come here uh, and, and give a talk, I offered him uh, a choice of three topics, and he said that all three were interesting. So I sort of gulped, and then I thought about it, and I, then I thought, yes, actually, there is a single story, really, that explains all three topics. So that's why you'll see the three-part title. Uh, <clears throat> so this is another one of those talks which says that the world is coming to an end. I'm sure you've heard many of them. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, what's happening is, in some sense, we're reaching the end of Moore's law, but that doesn't mean the end of progress. It just means we have to go in different directions to continue to make progress. So it's becoming a very exciting time. Uh, for example, memory chips are no longer growing, and they haven't been, uh, in terms of density, very fast at all. And this has been the case for many years now. Memory chips certainly are not growing in speed anymore, and that's been true for over a decade. Uh, we do have large RAM available on server class motherboards, but the commodity market doesn't want to pay for that. And so if they don't pay for that, then we're stuck with commodity motherboards that only accept four gigabytes of RAM. But what's happening at the same time? Well, CPUs are not getting faster, but in some sense we're getting more of them on the chip. We're getting more and more multi-core, and so this is putting more and more pressure on the RAM. And to make things even worse, one of the other things which we find uh, very interesting to investigate is the, the heterogeneous computing. So in particular, for example, right now I'm teaching a course on the uh, general purpose GPU programming. Uh, and this simply puts even more pressure on the RAM. Now we're asking the RAM to do more and more. Uh, so we need a new way to write our programs, at least for those that don't run solely in cache. If you're using RAM, you have to think harder. And if you're using RAM and you want to go to 8 and 16 cores, then maybe even the RAM won't be enough. And now you have to think harder about where is it all going to spill over onto. So uh, our view is that disk is the new RAM. And so we just have to take all the old solutions we have and try to reorganize them at a lower level in the hierarchy. So disk is, the, is going to be the new RAM, we claim, and RAM will be the new cache. And then the cache will simply be an ultra-fast cache. Um, so uh, the argument here is that the bandwidth, well, before I go into this argument, let me just say a little about what our group has been doing for the last uh, decade or two. So we started out working a lot in um, uh, parallel computing at a time when the assumption was that the bottleneck is how do you get more CPUs to work on it. Uh, and then at some point, because of these issues that I'm talking about, we feel that the, uh, the issue has shifted over. And so while there are many groups that are very interested in uh, petahertz computing, in, in our case, we're very interested in petabyte computing. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we're very interested in also is, is any groups out there, for example, here at Google, which might in fact have uh, data sets approaching or beyond petabyte, uh, because then the ways to manipulate those data sets efficiently, they start to change. And while you can always use the old programming methods to do it, using the old programming methods is very error prone. It's extremely hard to debug. Uh, now, when you're working with many disks, uh, you have your one second bug, your one minute bug, your one hour bug, your one day bug, and then you get to the one week bug. And the one week bug says that on, process, on node number 27, there's a problem with file number 133. Now what do you do to debug that? So you, you need new tools. And this really is the general direction we're going in. Um, so let, let's look at uh, the idea that disk is the new RAM. Why do we say this? Uh, if you view it correctly, the bandwidth of a disk is about 100 megabytes per second. Uh, so if you take 50 disks, a 50-node cluster. These days, that's just a departmental cluster. Five gigabytes per second. 
Uh, so, but what's the bandwidth of RAM? Also on the order of five gigabytes per second. So in terms of bandwidth, if you can use the 50 local disks of your cluster in parallel, then you have the same bandwidth as a single RAM subsystem. So we want to view the, uh, the distributed disks of a cluster uh, as if we have a new kind of machine, a machine in which we have uh, perhaps 10 terabytes or more of shared memory, shared RAM. The shared RAM is on disk. So, uh, and then uh, as far as the CPUs, if you have 32 CPUs, think of them as 32 uh, cores. Or if these are quad core, then we have 128 cores accessing your 10 terabytes of shared RAM. And that's the way we want to think of the machine. Uh, well, of course, we have a problem. When you have 50 disks um, and you try to put 50 disks on it, the latency doesn't get any better. So what do you do if the latency doesn't get any better? The answer is you have to reorganize your data structures and your low-level algorithms, your accessor algorithms. You have to do it in a careful way so that you don't overload the network. Um, and we've been studying how to do this now for about five years. We've gone through a series of case histories, in, in, especially in computational algebra. But then more recently, we decided to showcase the example of Rubik's Cube to say that these methods are now working. And we view our future now as we know the techniques, we know how they interact. Now we want to develop a kind of mini language extension that's going to automatically call these techniques and make it easy for the non-expert to use the uh, 10 terabytes of disk on their cluster as if it's just RAM. Uh, and there's an interesting story there, too. But before we go into that story, let's talk about Rubik's Cube, since it is a topic which is popular among many people. It uh, certainly uh, managed to hit the press, in, in our case, when we were able to announce that 26 moves suffice. And uh, at the end, you'll see there's even a, a short addendum to, uh, to that story. But let's begin the story. So. Uh, the story is that uh, Rubik's Cube was invented in the late 1970s by a man named Rubik. Uh, already by 1982, people wanted to know, well, how many moves do you need to always solve Rubik's Cube? What's the worst possible position, and how many moves will you need to solve it then? Well, uh, people already know of one particular position, uh, in which case you need uh, 20 moves. And in fact, there have been some people who've been exploring and have now come up with thousands and maybe millions of uh, cases where you need these 20 moves. So at this point, the best guess is that either you need 20 moves always to solve it, or maybe 21, but there, maybe there are only a few examples of this 21 case, and we just haven't found them yet. But most people believe that's where the story would stop. Uh, OK, what can we do today? Well, starting in 1982, they were looking for this number. How many moves does it take to solve Rubik's Cube? And they, uh, this was called God's number. Uh, and it, they were figuring already in 1982, essentially without using computers in any significant way, had already decided it was between 17 and 52. Uh, by 1990, uh, three of us at Northeastern uh, actually did the problem for the two by two by two cube. So this is a case where we had a four megabyte workstation and we needed to squeeze the, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the million states or so onto, uh, onto this. It's equivalent to solving the three by three by three with just the corner cubies if you want to try that. And what we did is we found a data structure that allowed us to do it using only one megabyte of RAM. And so we were able to show the number of moves needed Going back to three by three by three, Reed in a landmark computation showed 29 moves in 95. Uh, just about a year and a half ago, uh, or two years, Radu showed 27 moves. Last year, uh, we brought it down to 26. But we brought it down to 26 by taking a different uh, view than Reed and Radu. You have to use a divide and conquer where you split the problem into two pieces. They tried to split it into two equal sized pieces. Uh, and they got 29 and 27 moves. We decided to split into two very unequal pieces, one of which was much too large for the RAM, much too large for the aggregate RAM of a cluster, and another piece which was quite small and very easy to, to analyze. And so the large piece required us, of course, to use the parallel disk-based computation. So this is what made it a showcase for us. 
And we're, we're not at the end of the line there. Uh, we, we believe we can go lower still. And uh, as I say, at the end of, the, of this portion, I'll tell the rest of that story. But in any case, uh, last year we had this paper, 26 moves suffice, uh, using this different approach where we just take 20, uh, we divide, split it into a very large problem and a very small problem. So uh, there are about 4.3 times 10 to the 19 states, or people say that I should call it, uh, I think it's uh, 43 quintillion. Uh, solutions by uh, human beings are more or less along the lines you would think. For example, solve one face, uh, then memorize a number of move sequences that preserve one face then using those sequences, go back and try to solve the rest of the cube while always preserving that first face. So in the computer, we try to do something like this also, except the computer has a much bigger memory. So we can play that game in a better way. Uh, so here's the way one would represent the cube. Generators up, down, front, back, left, right. Uh, so the reachable states are just everywhere you can arrive at by making those moves. The number of states is given as before. Uh, so we consider, uh, so we need to break it into two problems. To break it into two problems, we'll take a subgroup of all the moves. This subgroup is simply going to be, <coughs> maybe it's better if I point, uh, is up here. Uh, we'll still allow ourselves the moves up and down, but only left squared, right squared, front squared, and back squared. So this means instead of making 90 degree twists, we insist it has to be 180 degree twist. Now you can't reach all the states. So this is what was done in 1995. Using this idea, one can then take the cube, the size of the subgroup, and this gives you your two problems. A problem of size two times 10 to the ninth and two times 10 to the 10th. Two problems of about equal size. Uh, and at that time, uh, in fact, running on a uh, CM5 at the time, if I remember, so one of the supercomputers of that time. Um, Reed was uh, able to find, a, uh, find bounds on this and get the solution of 29 moves suffice. Uh, you, you find shorter solutions up here at this level, and then down inside the subgroup, you, you, uh, you can allow yourself to make all moves. So uh, roughly speaking, this is how we're dividing it. Uh, the language comes from uh, mathematical group theory, but the concepts, I think, are quite, uh, 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 quite accessible regardless. It's just the names are a little different. So the full problem, we'll call that the group. Uh, we're going to split all the states, those four point, the 43 quintillion states, into what are called cosets, uh, cosets of a subgroup. In some sense, we have this subgroup, which is a subset of states, but it's preserved under a certain uh, subset of the moves. And then we have various images of that when you allow yourself to make any move. And one can easily show that you can partition all the states into these cosets. And so this already, from this you can already see what the game is going to be. The game is going to be that wherever you are, say you're over here, and you need to find the shortest solution. Uh, maybe it's too much to search 43 quint quintillion, but you can jump through the cosets and find a shorter solution in the coset space. Then jump down now that you know you're inside the original subgroup from which everything else is an image, look at where you are, and proceed to make moves here. So figure out the worst number of moves up there, the worst number of moves down here, add this and this, and you have a new upper bound for Rubik's Cube. So uh, OK, so the idea is pretty simple. And, uh, <clears throat> and so what happened is, uh, in this case, in 1995, they decide to break it up into two roughly equal sized problems because that produces only a billion cases to check. And if it were much more than that, they would have run out of uh, storage. They would have, would have run out of RAM. It would have been a problem. So by making the two problems equal size, that's great. If they're unequal, then one problem is going to overflow the capacity of the machine. Uh, and of course, this is done purely in RAM. At that time, people were not thinking of using uh, disk for the computation. Uh, so uh, these are some details which aren't that important. Roughly speaking, the key things to take away from this is we say we, we're going to get two upper bounds. We'll work in coset space, number one, and we'll show that the worst case is 12 possible moves. Then once you arrive at the subgroup, we'll say the worst possible case is 18 possible moves. 
and then we'll add them. Adding is pessimistic because, in general, you won't always arrive at the worst case here. You usually arrive at it some average state. But all, all we can prove is suppose you land in the worst case. 12 plus 18, well, 30 moves suffice. But in fact, you can isolate a few of the very worst cases, and they're not too many, and then you just solve them one by one. And so now you can show, well, one, uh, really the worst cases don't count, and we can cut it down to 29 moves. And then Radu, playing a very similar game, but uh, doing more extensive computations, cut down the same approach to 27 moves. So, uh, so then what, what did we do? As I said, we want to break it up into two problems of different sizes. So here we see 6 times 10 to the 13th versus 6 times 10 to the 5th. 6 times 10 to the 5th is great. Now we're practically doing the whole problem inside cache, never mind RAM. So, uh, so Q is incredibly small. Uh, and then, on the other hand, the 10 to the 13th is a problem. It's a problem for RAM. It's a problem for the aggregate RAM of a cluster. One needs to do something different. Uh, but if one does something different, there's pay dirt at the end. So again, we, we have our two problems. We'll say that uh, we can consider using all generators. Uh, and we'll build a subgroup saying that we're going to allow ourselves only the squares of these moves. This means we'll only we will only allow 180 degree rotations. If we only allow 180 degree rotations, now the reachable set is this small number, 6 times 10 to the fifth. Um, and, but the nice thing about this also is these, these also, it's a very symmetric set of moves. Whether you choose to make the move u squared first or l squared first, it doesn't matter. Just turn the cube on another side and u squared looks like l squared. Or if you choose to make d squared first, turn the cube on the other side, and it looks like d squared. So you're going to get the symmetries of the cube, and that's going to cut down your problem. And Reed and Radu also knew this, and they used this in their case. But in their case, they didn't have quite as many symmetries, since u does not look like l squared. u and l squared are different. So now we have, in some sense, the most possible symmetries, and we get to cut down the problem even further, a little uh, bonus for this approach. So once we cut down by symmetries, uh, now uh, after symmetries, we're looking at the large problem taking 10 to the 12th. So 10 to the 12th, let's see, 10 to the 9 is a billion. So now we're saying a trillion cases. And the small problem is tiny. Uh, a trillion cases to check. Well, that, that's not so bad for computers. Not at all. Uh, we just, the, uh, in terms of CPU time, it's clearly doable on any reasonable cluster, no problem. Except, if we're going to find those shortest paths over here, and now if there are a trillion of them, where do we store them in RAM? So that's the uh, key question. So we have a trillion cases to check. The CPU time is not a problem. It's the storage that's killing us. And what we claim is that this is symptomatic of many of the newer problems that we're facing. It's no longer the RAM that's the problem. It's the storage. Where are we going to store it all? Uh, and if you don't store it on RAM, you can store it on disk. If it's just video, great. Streaming access, you can store your uh, 700 megabyte video file. But if you have a lot of small pieces of information, how do you store that on disk? And in our case, we do. Each state can be represented in a very tiny way. Ultimately, we use some tricks to represent each state in only half of one byte. So we have all these states, each of which is half of one byte. And if we're not smart about it, we have to continually do random access through these states, of, which are half of one byte each. And that would be a disaster on disk, complete disaster. Uh, you want half of one byte, you need to load in at least the disk block and maybe 100 kilobytes just to amortize over the bad latency. So in any case, uh, let's continue with the Rubik's Cube before I go back to the disk-based computation. So for Rubik's Cube, uh, we, divide, we get our two answers, 16 moves in the coset space and then 13 moves in the tiny group once you're done with the coset space. 16 and 13 is 29. This is without any further processing at all, just from the pre-computation alone. So the pre-computation alone already gives you 20 mo 29 moves, which in some sense ties what Reed got after he was done. Then we do the, some of the post-computations. 15 and 13, this brings it down to 28 moves. Uh, and, and then 
uh, on another side, we can actually bring it down a little more. This will make more sense in the, in the later slide, where I'll point out how we finally get down to 26, where we see our savings. Uh, but in any case, we go from 29 to 26 moves by getting, getting rid of so, uh, some cases where we just do a case-by-case case examination. Uh, in fact, my student following this original approach uh, probably is going to get down to 25 moves. What we'll hear before the end of this, though, is in fact there is competition. Somebody else just recently, just before I came here, uh, uh, announced and provided a paper saying that he's, he's also reached 25 uh, and using a different method. And what we're excited about for the future is now to combine the two. But let's get to that. So let's first understand what is we, we did, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little about the future, and then get back to the parallel disk-based computation. So uh, here we see what's going on in the coset space. This is the large problem. In the large problem, we said we were able to cut it back to 16 cases. Well, already up here, you can see one place where there's clearly something good to do to get below the initial 29 moves from the pre-computation. We can definitely examine these 17 cosets one by one and show in each case, look, these really don't really take 29 moves. They take much less. Uh, and, and that's a very fast computation, extremely fast. Yeah, even uh, up here, there's a lot of hope because this is only 300 million. So effectively, what we did is at this end, we did a case-by-case -case analysis and cut it down. And then at the low end, we were able to cut it down also. At the low end, for example, at level two, well, at level two, we have uh, only three elements. And one can examine each of those three elements in coset space and show directly right here that in principle, for all those cosets at, le at level two, we would need 13 plus two or 15 moves. But in fact, you do a case-by-case -case analysis and you show, no, you only need 14 moves. So you can show that you don't need 15 moves total when you include the small problem. You need only 14 moves. So therefore, this needs only one move less. Here, we need only one move less. Here, here we need one move less. Here, one move less. Here, one move less. Here, we did a more intensive analysis, and we actually showed you can get away with two moves less than the naive estimate. So, and so there we are. One, two, three moves we save. 29 minus 3 is 26. Um, good. <clears throat> and, and so this is more or less a summary of what I did, what I said. Uh, it happens to use uh, something called top C, task-oriented parallel C, C++. It wasn't essential to our co computation, but it was convenient. It's um, a task-oriented uh, package for easily doing parallel computation. Uh, and because we already knew it in-house, we knew how to use it very efficiently. So the parallelism didn't stop us at all. The, the hard part was actually debugging the disk space computation. Uh, and, and here you see the two moves lined up side by side. Uh, in fact, one can even say the two approaches. And as I said, the two approaches, uh, just recently, uh, Thomas Rokiki has shown how to move this down lower even to 25. And so now, in our column, we want to take his idea and apply it using the large coset space. Um, just a little bit about what the techniques were, and then we'll come back to the uh, parallel disk-based computation. So fundamentally, there were two ideas. One we've discussed a lot about. Uh, point number two, we, use, uh, we're end up, we end up using large amounts of intermediate disk space, seven terabytes, uh, for a hash array. Uh, be, and why do we do this? Well, fundamentally, we're doing a kind of breadth-first search. When you do breadth-first search, you get a frontier. When you get a frontier or open list, you have to check, is this a state that I've ever seen before? Uh, if it is, then throw it away. Well, how can you check that? The usual way we do it when we're in RAM is we use a hash array. So already this points to one of the problems if we're going to use disk as the new RAM. We can't use hash arrays directly. Uh, we, we need to do something different. Uh, if you've seen the abstract, you've seen what the trick was there. Uh, instead of doing standard duplicate elimination, elimination, we're going to capture a lot of uh, accesses to the hash array, and then we're going to use something called delayed duplicate 
uh, detection. But before going on to that, I'll just say the other trick that we needed to do what we were doing is we were using these symmetrized cosets. That's this coset space where we've already taken account of the symmetries. Uh, and we're getting, uh, and we're able to get 10 million multiplies per second. Uh, so, and this uses a certain amount of uh, uh, mathematical group theory, uh, certain computational techniques, some of which have some small added novelty, but fundamentally the, the major ideas were already known before. Um, so, uh, so in any case, um, what we're able to do then is we're able to, to do a kind of table-based multiplication. Uh, and the tables are kept mostly in the L1 cache, since the t and that's also critical for getting 10 million moves per second. We have to work with an L1 cache. If we even go to L2 cache, it's gonna slow down. Uh, and at that point, the CPU time really does threaten to become a bottleneck. But by keeping this in L1 cache, we can make moves blindingly fast, and now the only problem is the disk storage. Uh, so uh, we don't need to do too much of this. This is simply meant to convince you that there are easy ways to decompose the problem of making a move. In. And so instead of, needing, instead of having one huge table saying, here's the list of all cosets, and we want to make this move, we can break it down into pieces. We can break a group into corner cubies and edge cubies. And then if we do it in the right way, there's some technical details. We can set up a table for what happens to the corner cubies when you make a move and what happens to the edge cubies. Now you have two tables that are approximately the square root of the size of the original table. Well, let's take the edge cubies. It turns out you can uh, split that up, for example. Uh, also, for the edge cubies, you might split it up into uh, the possibility of just flipping the faces but not actually moving the faces or moving the edge cubies to a completely different location. And so you can split this up into two different tables. So you continue to split a huge table of state, comma, generator into many states. Uh, the state based on edges looking at flips only, the state based on edges looking on how you move the edges, the states based on corner cubies, and so you end up with about uh, under 10 tables, all of which mostly fit in L1 cache, or potentially always fit in L1 cache. It depends what CPU you're using. Uh, so th this is just more of the same. And now uh, what I was saying is a bit of the future, uh, where it's going to be even more interesting, I think. Uh, so Thomas Rokiki recently announced, just before coming here, as I said, uh, in this paper, that uh, he has a new complementary approach that can produce uh, an upper bound of 25 moves. So that's in the other column. And what's exciting to us is that we believe that we can uh, do something like what he does, uh, and we can get down to 24, maybe 23, maybe less. We haven't had time yet to analyze it and see. But fundamentally, just to not leave you in suspense, and, and I encourage you to look up his paper. I assume he'll be putting it, he'll be making it fully public uh, sometime in the near future. Um, fundamentally, what he's doing is he looks at the worst case up here. He looks at states which, uh, at levels in which there are so many states that it would be very hard to analyze each one case by case. And what he notes is you don't have to analyze each one case by case you can just take states at random and analyze them and show that these states, at, these states at random, you can do them in very few moves. And they say, hey, if you can do this state in very few moves, all the states in the neighborhood of that can also be done in a reasonable number of moves. And what we hadn't been sure of, but what Thomas Rokiki has shown is that uh, that works. The topology here in which states are connected to other states by moves, the topology is dense enough that it really works to just take random states, find nearby states, and show that uh, if a random state can be solved in very few moves, there are a lot of nearby states, a lot of ne and eventually you have to cover every state, but it turns out that that really can be done using the other approach of uh, using this approach. And so we believe if it worked over here, it should work over here too. Uh, stay tuned to see what happens on that end. Okay, uh, next, what are the longer term goals? 
So it's, it's, it's all very nice to do Rubik's Cube, but that's uh, not really what's going to uh, solve, solve our current problem of limited RAM and more and more cores on a, on a CPU. Um, so, so why did we do it? Well, because it's there. Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, in fact, another reason to do it is simply it provides a, a crossroads where people from different disciplines can get together and compare their techniques. So there are people from AI who do search. There are people from uh, operations research who, who do branch and bound, which is closely related. Uh, there are even formal verification methods where you try to represent many states by a logical formula. Uh, and, and using various methods like this, the different disciplines uh, can actually attack the same problem. And it's not so often that you find an example like this. So therefore, it's a very nice example for this purpose. Uh, it's no longer instead of having the different disciplines each working within their own discipline and saying we have a good method and we don't talk to the other people, now there's a common case where we can actually compare. Um, next, uh, the other thing, as I said, is because the world is running out of RAM. And this is the case that I made earlier. Uh, so if the world is running out of RAM, we, uh, we want to show, in fact, contrary to what I said in my first slide, that this is not the end of the world. Uh, that there are ways to get around it. So this is an example of how to get around it, but uh, we can do uh, better. So uh, the world is changing. This is what we said before. Uh, well, so, so essentially the claim is what I said orally. Suppose we did have a single computer with 10 terabytes of RAM and maybe 200 CPU cores. Would would that satisfy your need for more space? And we think in most cases it would. Uh, so what our claim is then is just look at a de departmental cluster, maybe 32 quad core nodes. It's very cheap these days, certainly under $100,000 uh, and, and getting lo cheaper all the time. Uh, Want to put a 500 gigabyte uh, local disk on each one. Uh, it's, they're very inexpensive now. Uh, and uh, at that point, the numbers work out. So, so let's look at that. So when is a cluster like a 10 terabyte shared memory computer? So these are the little riddles that's fun to ask. Um, so uh, we can assume, so we'll, in this case we'll make a very moderate assumption. Assume only 200 gigabytes of your local disk is free and the rest of it's being used. Um, after all, Part of the thing to realize is when you're designing a new cluster, you can buy a 512 gigabyte disk, you can buy a 200 or 500 gig or a 250 gig disk. There's very little savings in buying the 250 gig disk. So usually what you'll do is you'll buy the 500 gig disk and say maybe we'll have expansion in the future. Let's just pay the extra 2 or 3%, 5% on the cost of the whole cluster as insurance so the cluster can grow uh, organically. Well, uh, in that case, you now have 200 gig per node free. And now you have your 10 terabyte shared memory computer. It's just sitting there being unused. Be those disk cycles are just falling on the floor. Uh, assume 50 nodes. So again, it's a computation very similar to the one I just went through. Uh, and here I make the argument about economics again. So let's go to the other side. When is a cluster not like a 10 terabyte shared memory computer? Uh, that's very important. We already spoke about the latency problem here. But in addition to latency, uh, the very first thing we have to observe is now we have to write a parallel program. Uh, we can't just say all we want is the 10 terabytes and we'll use one core, thank you very much, that's all we need. You really have to write the program as a parallel program. Um, and then you do have to worry about the latency. And then finally, if you're gonna write it as a parallel program, then you are going to be using the network. And if you use the network, then can the network keep up with the disk? So we'll give various hand-waving arguments just to say that this is reasonable. Ultimately for us, we do it because it works. We've done it for five years on a variety of examples, and none of these issues have ever stopped us yet. But looking at it introspectively and trying to figure out why we offer these hand-waving uh, cases. So as I say, answer number one, well, we used this architecture and it works the empirical answer. Uh, we've done a number of computations in computational algebra, then Rubik's Cube down here, 
in progress. We're doing, it's, uh, the technical name is coset enumeration, but effectively just think of it as a pointer chasing problem. And in spirit, it's sort of the same as the problem of converting a non-deterministic finite automaton to a deterministic finite automaton, a classic problem in computer science that, uh, that everyone in computer science would know. So, uh, so what we're doing is we're, trying, we're looking for cases that should be hard, and then we're trying to wipe them out one by one. And then at the end, we say, well, we think we have good coverage. And that's really going to be the argument. Not that this will always work. We can not never guarantee that it will always work. But if we can demonstrate good coverage across most common applications, then maybe that makes the point. OK, so coming back to these three questions, we'll ask them again. Uh, so question number one, we require a parallel program. Uh, so we have to access the local disks of many nodes in parallel. Uh, so our bet, and in a sense we still have to prove it, is that any sequential algorithm that wants to create gigabytes of RAM-based data, if it really wants to create gigabytes of RAM-based data, probably there's some parallelism in it. Uh, it's unlikely that it plans to create the gigabytes of data byte by byte or word by word, one after another, and it cannot create the next word until it's seen the very last word in the gigabytes of data. This, I think, would be a highly unusual example. So if we are creating gigabytes at a time, there should be, again, it's a hand-waving example, but in every case we've seen so far, there should be some natural parallelism. We, we really don't depend on building a gigabyte of data word by word in, in the way we work day to day. Then there's the latency problem, of course. Uh, and and that's, that's probably the big question. Uh, that's the one that, uh, where you really have to do some work to get around it. So the observation here for the latency problem is that solutions do exist. Uh, so uh, in the case of Rubik's Cube, we basically were looking at the frontier in some kind of state space search. And there, the solution was delayed duplicate detection, DDD. So it's, it's not a term that we invented. It was, has been around before. Uh, but we've tried to extend that idea intensively. So it implies uh, waiting until many nodes of the next frontier uh, are, have been discovered. And then once you have them, you can remove duplicates. How can you do this? Uh, well, uh, let me just give you, uh, well, well, what you would do is you'd probably want to use a hash table. So if you're going to do this and you want to use a hash table, aha, hash tables. Those don't seem to work well with disk, do they? If you want to make one hash access, by definition, you're using a pseudo-random function. By definition, you have the worst possible locality. So uh, for hash tables, what do you do? Well, the answer is yes, it's highly non-local. And if it were local, then you have a bad hash function. But you can wait until there are millions of hash queries, or billions or trillions, depending on what level you're playing this game. And then, once you've done that, then sort on the hash index uh, and scan the disk to resolve the queries. So hopefully it's clear. We have our billions of hash queries. We uh, apply the hash function in using streaming access. We proceed to produce a hash index for each one. And now we sort the data based on the hash index. And now we can read the hash array. And in our case, for Rubik's Cube, it might have been the frontier. Compare the frontier with a hash array in hash index order. It all goes very fast. And, and this, is, this is what worked for us, too. In the Rubik's Cube computation, uh, the whole computation ultimately took uh, something on the order of some number of cluster days. Let's call it a cluster week. And that was it. Uh, the, and the longest time was typically just waiting in the queue to get access to the cluster. Um, so uh, good. So uh, of course, we have to sort. But as is well known, there are techniques like external sorting, which allows one to do that. In fact, for Rubik's Cube, we didn't use this method. We didn't sort. Uh, there are more efficient methods, too, which you can find if you want to read our papers more closely. Um, in this case, there is a, an abin-based approach in which you take the hash index you look at the high bits of the hash index and say, ah, the high bits of the hash index, that will be my bin number. And I'll put it in that bin. And that bin, of course, is simply a separate file on disk. So you segment all of your queries into different bins, 
and now you can load up each bin and only one portion of the hash index. If you do it of the hash array, if you do it right, it all fits in RAM, and now you don't need any sorting, and fewer accesses to disk also, so the whole thing speeds up. Uh, pointer chasing, you can play the same game. Uh, yeah, if you have to chase just one pointer, you have a problem, just like if you have to do just one hash index. But if you're willing to chase billions of pointers at the same time, you can make this work. And so for us, that's the solution to pointer chasing. Uh, tracing strings, again, it's something very similar. Wait until there are millions of strings, uh, and tracing strings becomes very much like pointer chasing. So what we claim is the low-level details can be worked out. Uh, and part of the problem now is just to make it easily accessible to the programmer so they don't have to write it and debug it themselves. And, and that's what we want to do in the future. Finally, there was a third question. The third question, can the network keep up with the disk? Uh, and again, it's a hand-waving case, but we've looked back at what we've done, and it hasn't worried us. And so we're trying to think, why did, was it never a worry for us? And so ultimately, uh, the argument for us is that uh, the point-to-point -point, uh, bandwidth of gigabit Ethernet is 100 megabytes per second. The bandwidth of disk, 100 mega megabytes per second. They match. So the only issue is the aggregate bandwidth of net the network. How many point-to-point -point streams can we manage at the same time? If we need all-to-all -all communication, then we would be sunk. Well, do we need all-to-all -all com uh, communication? For that answer, we go back to uh, other parallel programs. Uh, the world has a long history of many parallel programs by now. So let's look at parallel programs which are operating solely in RAM and not on disk. When they were operating in RAM, they never seemed to be bothered too much by the fact that the network couldn't keep up if they do all-to-all -all computation, all-to-all -all, uh, communication. Uh, so in fact, in practice, most previous parallel programs did not overload the network and so we'll make that hand-waving argument that, this, that on fast RAM, they were not overloading the network. We want to use slow disk instead of fast RAM. If we use slow disk, now for sure we're not going to overload the network because we can't push the network as fast. The disk can't, can't take it in as quite as fast. Um, OK, so. Uh, the long-term goal, as I've said, is that uh, we think we know what the building blocks are. Can we build a language on top of it? A language and a runtime library. Uh, and that's the natural thing to ask next. So now that we have the experience, uh, and here are just a few of the techniques that are well known. There are quite a few others. Uh, can we take it to the next level and then make it really accessible where anybody can start writing this and running it, writing these types of programs and running it on their own departmental cluster? And we believe that's doable. Uh, my student is working on that now for his thesis, uh, Daniel Kunkel, uh, who I should give him credit. Daniel Kunkel is the one also who was the first author on the Rubik's Cube result. And um, what he's doing is he's building on some previous experience in our group. So there's this other joint paper with another student of mine, Eric Robinson, in which we make the following observation. Uh, if this is what you want to do, then there are some space-time trade-offs for using the additional disk. And it, these, so think initially just of the traditional space-time trade-offs that you've heard everybody talk about forever in working solely in RAM. And what we've done is we've identified a number of techniques, and we've observed that in each case you can view it as a space-time trade-off. And this is very natural because if one of these techniques was better in space and better in time, then we would simply ignore anything that's slower in space and time both. So the only techniques that survive this initial filter, so filter, a technique that is slower in space and slower in time is not competitive, we throw it away. We therefore want to just filter through and keep those techniques which are either faster in time or faster in space. Uh, and what we're left with is a hierarchy. Uh, and in this hierarchy, we see that for the uh, the names don't, don't matter. You can read the paper if you're interested in what these things do. Uh, if this were a longer talk, I might be tempted to talk about some of these techniques because they are quite nice. Uh, some of them were known in the past. Some of them were invented by our group. Uh, but the key idea here is, well, here we have growing space, but hopefully less time. <laughs> 
And in the past, we would cut it here and say, when you run out of RAM, that's it. So use whatever's closest to this uh, dividing line. In our example here, we would stop at the landmarks method and use, and use landmarks and said, we have no more RAM. We can't do any better. What we're observing here is, well, actually, there are two cutoff points, here and here. <clears throat> if you're willing to go to disk, you also get these space-time trade-offs. And in our experience, we have very often found that the best disk-based method is actually faster than the best RAM-based method. Because the RAM-based methods are having to do all sorts of dynamic on-the-fly compression or, in order to squeeze it into RAM. Whereas if you just lay it on on disk, uh, and sometimes even have duplicated data so you can access what you need more efficiently, you can do better. So, uh, so therefore, the philosophy of our group is to take this dividing line and say, this is what we'll use. We can't do any better because we've now run out of this space. And so it's a kind of, uh, it seems to be a, a bit of a paradox. We're saying that any time that we run out of RAM and we want to do a computation faster, then the solution is to use some of that very slow disk, disk that is 1,000 times slower than RAM or more. And by using this very slow disk instead of the fast RAM, we will make the computation go faster. But it works. It works as long as you think about space-time trade-offs. And, and uh, so if the world had only one algorithm, then yes, you would stop at the end of RAM, and that would be it, because RAM is faster than disk. But the world has more than one algorithm. The world has a bunch of algorithms and nicely ordered, in fact, according to the space-time trade-off. So, and often, this is the winner, not the one based on RAM. It's just that traditionally, we, ne we always thought of disk as being too slow. So the old uses of disk were as a file system, as a database, and as a swapping region. What we want to say is disks now have a fourth use. Disk can be used actively as a substitute for RAM, and RAM becomes the cache. So it's no longer just a file system, database, and swapping region, uh, but an active substitute for RAM. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to skip this. Uh, you're, you're welcome to read this slide later, or even the paper, if you want the full details. Uh, but it's just an example of one of the techniques we used. Uh, because what I really want to come down to, come to now is uh, another work in our group, which we're very excited about. So this is the third part of our title, uh, the user level checkpointing. Um, so checkpointing has a very long history. Uh, there have been, uh, in some sense, successful checkpointing programs for uh, at least 20 years. Uh, Condor, with its process migration, uh, effectively introduced one kind of checkpointing very early on. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but, and, and we find we need uh, checkpointing. But in fact, the kind of checkpointing that's out there and available doesn't really do what we want. Uh, of course, we have a long-running parallel computation. Long-running parallel computations crash. Uh, when they do crash, you uh, have to figure out how to restart. Uh, there are, right now, and, and plus, it's, we do need the parallelism. We do need distributed checkpointing. Many of the solutions previously were either sequential solutions or else they depended on specific software like a particular dialect of MPI, message passing interface. We want a general solution that will solve the problem once and for all because then it opens up still other opportunities for the future that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so uh, kernel level checkpointing has a problem. The kernel level checkpointing requires that you modify the kernel. Makes sense. Uh, and if you have to modify the kernel, you can no longer bundle your checkpointing package with the application and just distribute it as one large package. Uh, because that means the user is going to put it on some unknown kernel out there, on some unknown cluster. And maybe they don't have the necessary kernel level support. Maybe they haven't modified the kernel. Maybe they don't have root privilege. So maybe they're not allowed to modify the kernel. On many clusters, the typical user does not have root privilege. So, uh, at this, so our thought is, well, let's try it with user-level checkpointing. This means operate only in user space, no root privilege needed, uh, and we can embed the whole thing in a library. Uh, in user space, well, now checkpointing divides into two problems. 
Problem number one, copy all of user space memory to disk. Well, luckily, that's easy. Uh, problem number two, copy the state of the kernel to disk. That depends on the API for the kernel. But luckily, the Linux kernel today has a very rich API, not only system calls, but the proc file system interface. And using this, we can find out everything we want to know about the state of our process. The kernel will tell us. We'll copy that information into user space. Now we copy the user space data onto disk. And when we want to restart, we invert the whole thing. We bring it user space memory back in. And we then tell the kernel, please put the process in the following state. We want these file descriptors open. We have these pseudo TTYs. Please give them back to us. Uh, th these, this is where we did an MMAP. Don't forget that, and so on and so on. Um, the package is DMTCP. It's freely available open source. Uh, you're certainly welcome to all uh, look at it. And our plan, in fact, is that in the next month or so, we want to uh, produce Linux packages. So this is still beta level software, let's say, but uh, soon uh, we want to have our version 1.0. Um, so uh, what, what, is it, what is the strategy that we used here? Well, one, one or two points maybe are worth mentioning because they have some novelty. Uh, perhaps foremost is the idea that we use a two-level architecture. So we had earlier work on something called MTCP, multi-threaded checkpointing. Uh, which would take a multi-threaded process and checkpoint it. So this is one step beyond the original uh, single-threaded checkpointing packages that we've had ever since the 1990s, certainly. Uh, and now, rather than extend it into DMTCP, our thought is let's build the checkpointing at two levels. MTCP knows only about its own process and nothing else. It knows nothing about sockets, for example. Uh, or pseudo TTYs, uh, Unix domain sockets, and so on. Uh, it knows nothing about forking child processes. And DMTCP is going to handle all the extra things. So, uh, and then DMTCP, when it's ready, will say, I've now uh, copied the state, all the state of your process that relates to multi process computation, uh, sockets, uh, pseudo TTYs and, uh, and so on. Uh, now MTCP, you should go ahead and do the rest. And MTCP knows about things like open file descriptors because that's unique to one process and it just does the rest. So by having these, this two level strategy, we also have greater portability, we hope, uh, on any system which already has the equivalent of MTCP working. We can then build the MTCP on top of it. Uh, so, uh, and it, we use, in DMTCP, we use a coordinator process that is mostly stateless. Uh, this could be a weakness, so therefore we want to keep the, the coordinator very fast. Uh, so it's mostly stateless and has only small pieces of communication with the processes. The main job of the coordinator process is to run through five barriers and tell everybody, we're now up to the next barrier, go. And so that scales very well. You can easily imagine it scaling to 1,000 processors, maybe even 10,000 processors, and the coordinator can probably handle it. And in fact, one thing we're very eager to do is if we can find some, uh, some guinea pigs, some groups who really would like to checkpoint 1,000 process computation, that would be a wonderful opportunity for us. We believe we can do it right now, uh, but we need the right collaborators on which to demonstrate. Unfortunately, in-house, we don't have our own thousand node facility, so we don't have a thousand node computation going on that we can just try it on. But we're currently searching for good partners there. Um, and the other comment is uh, the distributed part turns out not to be a hard problem at all. Other people have also thought of these ideas. Uh, using sockets, uh, you can send, each sender can send a cookie uh, and then flush. And when you flush it, you're flushing the kernel space buffer uh, into the user space of the remote process. The remote process keeps reading until it reads this cookie. The remote process then says, okay, we're ready. I've copied everything into user space. We can checkpoint. When we restart, we will simply invert the process. The remote process will send the, the buffer data back to the sender, and the sender can resend it and then wake up the application threads. Uh, we use uh, the idea the technique 
well, we have transparent initialization because we take advantage of LD preload in Linux. So we can, we, this allows us to create a checkpoint thread per process. Uh, we can create wrappers around certain infrequently called system calls, clone, bind, accept, listen. By doing this, we can detect any kind of network communication or inter-process communication as it happens. Uh, we can fork, as would be another example. Uh, as we detect these uh, infrequently, infrequent calls, we'll simply record, OK, there's something else for us to worry about when it comes time to checkpointing. Uh, we can also slightly modify these if we need to. This also gives us easy virtualization where we need it. Uh, at the same time, we make sure not to put wrappers around something like read or write, because those are used constantly, and we want to keep those uh, fast and untouched. OK, so uh, I think this gives you an idea. Uh, maybe I'll just say one other thing. One thing we're excited about for user level checkpointing also uh, is that what we're doing effectively is we're modeling the kernel. And then we recreate the state in the kernel upon restart. This is an approach that we can use not just for standard checkpointing of ordinary processes like this, but you can use it in other domains too. You can use it. Uh, to checkpoint graphics, if you view the graphics as some uh, black box in which you just need to recreate the state. GDB sessions. Uh, so the approach itself, I think, is a very powerful one. By working within user space instead of kernel space, we can now interact with these other user space libraries. And rather than checkpoint the entire library by brute force, we can inquire about their state and then recreate their state. So the advantage now is we can create very small checkpointing, checkpoint images, uh, much smaller than anything you would get from, uh, say, the excellent technology by, by VMware. And, by, and now you can have many small images. You can put these images on your USB key. You can save them for two months and come back and look at a scenario you're looking at, and so on. So uh, just as we have operating system images, the idea that you should be able to have process images that you carry around and reload onto any computer, even images that involve more than one process. That, that's something that we're very excited about, too. OK, thank you. Any questions? Yes? You mentioned like extensions to make some of this automatic. Is, that, uh, is the checkpointing what you were referring to? Um, so, so the question is that I mentioned language extensions to make some of this automatic, and is the, uh, is the checkpointing what I was referring to? Um, so primarily, uh, the checkpointing is helpful, but it's not the main uh, technology. Uh, the main technology we're thinking of is we already have runtime libraries that we've had to build just in order to make our own uh, programs work. Can we extend those runtime libraries and then put a nice syntactic layer on top of it so uh, a user who doesn't know the internals of our library can just write something very simple. And along these lines, there's an interesting idea called the Tilty desktop, uh, which, uh, which for me is something of an inspiration. The Tilty desktop says that in some lecture halls, they don't want the speaker to uh, put his coffee on the lectern because it can spill and ruin the electronics. So how do you do that? This lectern, I guess, is, is a little slanty. And the answer is, well, you make the lectern slanted. And now, if you put the coffee on it, it would obviously spill. So you can't put the coffee on it. You can only use the lectern for what it was meant for. And so in some sense, this is what we want to do for the parallel disk-based computation. Uh, we will make accessible the possibility of using disk, but we do not want the user using disk for one word operations at a time. That would be horrible. And so we want to bias the language in terms of streams. And if the user does try to build, do one word at a time, we'll force them to build an entire stream first and say, OK, now you can write your one byte. And, and so users hopefully will be biased into using disk the right way, not the wrong way. Yes? If you looked into how this might work with lazy functional language type of design, it seemed that that fit very well with long delays and then bringing stuff back together again. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. It would be very interesting to, to think about lazy function, uh, lazy uh, uh, lazy functions in uh, language design. I should say that our group is primarily uh, in high performance computing. Uh, at Northeastern University, we also have an excellent programming languages group. And if we can persuade them to get interested, then there would be a very natural collaboration there. 
uh, but within our group, uh, our expertise is not in that direction. Yes? Questions. <clears throat> You're assuming that all the sockets are intra cluster. No external uh -huh. communication. Yes. Um, do you want to ask the question, or shall I just assume it? <laughs> well, Good. I think, yes, I think I know where it's going. Um, Yes, exactly. So, so the point made was that we're uh, assuming that all uh, sockets are intra-cluster. And what happens when the sockets leave the cluster? Uh, and so informally, we like to talk about this as the problem of checkpointing the world. Uh, ultimately, you start with one process that has a socket open to somebody else, maybe a, uh, uh, a demon uh, for, uh, for routing or addresses or uh, uh, something. And so before you know it, you're actually going off-site and trying to checkpoint uh, uh, some, uh, some database for, uh, for addresses, for routing, for other protocols. Um, so this is why, in fact, uh, we think that the user-level approach is, has even some advantages over a kernel-level approach. Uh, in a kernel-level approach, we say that we want to keep the kernel small and simple. We have access to everything in the kernel and we'll just do the right thing. But then you get into the issue of what happens when the kernel ignorantly tries to say, ah, oh, I have a peer over here outside of my cluster. I should be talking to him. Uh, what do you do? You have to teach the kernel something. Now you're mixing kernel and user space. The design becomes a little harder. And it can be done. And there's some excellent people who have done excellent work in that direction. Uh, but in our case, our argument is that unlike the kernel pay people, we don't expect to get 100% coverage. We'll be quite happy if we can get 90% coverage, the most common applications. And so what we do is we look for these cases, and then every time we find a common case like this, we simply patch it. We say, oh, for example, NSCD was one that we had a problem with. Naming, I think it's naming service caching daemon. I forgot the initials exactly. Uh, this is a daemon. Um, that will get, get addresses from you for off-site, and it's, uh, it's obviously outside of user control. And glibc, depending on how you configure it, will automatically go to this daemon and ask for the information, uh, and then the daemon can cache it for everybody on the whole cluster. This is a disaster for us. So we detect when we're talking to the NSCD daemon, and when we are, we use other routes instead in order to get the information we need. So we have to add a wrapper around the system call that says, wait a minute, you're talking with the rest of the world. That's, that's not allowed. Uh, he, here, here's how we want you to get the information instead. So essentially, you can just restart the conversation and get the address again, but your re-execution will not be exactly. Um, yes, we, we can restart the computation to get the information again, but our computation will not be exact in, in the sense that we have to go get the information one more time and the daemon is allowed to give us a different answer the second time. That, that's completely correct. Um, but the alternative, yet the problem we had was that on restart, this daemon was actually creating a shared, uh, memory, uh, a shared memory portion in our memory, which is shared between the daemon and us. And when we restarted, we would look in the shared memory region, which we're sharing with the daemon, and look to see if we had the information there. And if not, we'd ask the demon, please add it to the shared memory region. And of course, the, sh the demon said, what shared memory region? You're a new process. I never saw you before. Uh, so ultimately, we're, we're forced into these workarounds. Yes? Any other questions? Um, yes, uh, Greg? So I, I have a question about model of computation. So uh, uh, in order for a uh, uh, for a uh, power computing system uh, to be uh, widely adopted, uh, it, it should be easy to express programs in this power, uh, in, in the model that the power computing system implements. Uh, so, uh, Macrotus is an example of uh, disk based computation where the reduced phase is delayed. Uh, however, the latency between map phase and reduced phase is amortized over a large amount of data that gets transferred in the two phases. So you mentioned the one example, uh, Ruby-based computation, and you also uh, 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 mentioned a, a few uh, building blocks that uh, regroup the data. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, comment on the model of computation that uh, you think would be uh, uh, successful. 
Good. So, so the comment is that if you look at MapReduce, it's employing a similar philosophy. Uh, in the re first, you do the map, and then after a certain amount of latency, you do the uh, reduction. Uh, and so, uh, so here also, you're you're taking advantage of this, and you can try to implement things like the delayed duplicate detection and so on that we discussed uh, in this talk. And, and I agree, MapReduce, in fact, has a philosophy that is very close to my heart. Rather than try to solve every single problem possible uh, in, in a way that's guaranteed that no one can ever create a program that will uh, fool your system, what we hope to do is try to get this 90, 95, 98% coverage. Uh, and so um, I think my impression of, the, uh, of MapReduce as it exists today is it wasn't designed to do all possible parallel computations. What they did is they took a certain model of computation, uh, which who knows, maybe it's 85, 90% of the needs of the users. I don't really know, and I'd be interested to discuss this in here to find out exactly what coverage you would say. Uh, and then they say, okay, we're going to do that portion of the applications very well and very easily for the user. And, and so our goal now is to uh, take it up to, let's say, 95% or 98%. But this is work in progress. We don't have a full solution today. Um, by the way, I, sh I should also say, as I said earlier, we are very eager to, f if anybody does, is dealing with, say, petabyte data sets, even 100 gigabyte, um, we would be very interested in working with you and seeing if we can uh, help solve your application because for us this is, would be a wonderful test bed and it's exactly this problem of coverage that we're facing ourselves. Um, if we're going to get to the 98% coverage level, then we need these examples with where you're using petabytes of disk and we need to demonstrate that our techniques work there also or else we can never reach the 98% level. Another question? I have petabytes of data, but nice. I, I'm trying to, well, I don't know if I can let you get yeah, it. <laughs> uh, I want to reduce the computation from taking four days, because it takes roughly that time to walk through it all, to hours. Yes. And that means switch, it, it's exactly reverse, I think, of what you're talking about. It's deparallelizing and doing things incrementally. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so as, as I understand, you have... Um, uh, many petabytes of data, and it takes days, uh, perhaps four days, to walk through it, and it'd be nice to reduce it to hours. Well, well, so, yeah, or get the answers I want within hours. Whether I walk through it all is another question. Good, good, or, or just get the answers. Walking through it is, is not absolutely required. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and, and I'll repeat our philosophy, and then I'd be very interested to talk to you after the talk to see where it would or would not map onto your prob problem. But for us, what we would say is, first of all, if, if, if uh, we're going to need to look at most of the data, then we have to get around the hardware bottleneck. And the best way to get around the hardware bottleneck is to spread the data over more disks. Um, so then we can uh, do that. And so, uh, and so rather than take the four days, maybe we can bring it down to less than one day uh, by looking at this in parallel. Uh, in a special case, maybe we don't need to look at, the, we might need to look at only one petabyte or 100 gigabytes, which would be relatively fast. Uh, and then at that point, we need to organize the computation. Now that we have much more parallelism than we started out with, we better have the right tools to deal with this extra parallelism, which is higher than we started with. And, and that's the, the, what we're trying to analyze. Yes? Two questions. Um, did you have to increase the parallelism of your application in this particular case to, to basically hide the latencies? Um, you're hiding latencies through, through that thing, a large amount of analog parallelism, right? Uh, did you have to increase parallelism? That's one question. The second one is um, you just mentioned uh, something which is kind of interesting uh, increasing um, the the size of the distributed um, deployment to increase speed. You can do the same thing uh, using memory instead of disk, or perhaps even solid state disks. Things like that. Have you thought about going in that direction as opposed to using just regular disks? Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so the uh, two questions, as I understand it, are number one in our work. Uh, 
did we have to uh, use additional parallelism by spreading the data even further among the disks? Uh, and number two, have we considered uh, the opportunities for using solid state disk uh, or, or, or other sim uh, yeah, competing technologies? Um, so, uh, so first, um, in, in many of our computations, we, on pencil and paper, we analyze the times, and it turns out we can predict the running times very accurately in advance. Um, it's hard to pick an exact number, but let's say within about 25 or 30 percent, we, we know how long it's going to run. And the reason we can predict it so accurately is because we know how much data we're dealing with, and we know what is the speed of the disk and the speed of the network and the speed of the RAM and the speed of the CPU uh, on, on the uh, in internal, uh, on the CPU intensive portion inside the loop. So we can, we can uh, determine the time very accurately and we know where the bottlenecks are. Surprisingly, on many of our computations, the bottleneck is not the CPU and it's not the disk. It's very often the RAM. <laughs> the RAM is too slow. Uh, and and th this is rather funny to us. Um, and this happens partly because of the specific algorithm we use in the time-space trade-off I referred to earlier. Uh, so it, depending on where you are in this time-space hierarchy, you may actually need to do extra CPU computation in order to squeeze the data down onto disk. And that's, but that's often our preference. Rather than uh, expand the parallelism uh, to instead try to make the data fit in a smaller space and that's another way of getting around the problem. When we do that, we have to spend more CPU time. Of course, if this is raw data, there may not be opportunities to do this. But in structured data like we're dealing with, we can. Uh, and, and then what happens is the CPU, we spend more CPU time. But in today's time of multi-core computing, spending more CPU time pushes the bottleneck not into the CPU, but actually into the RAM itself. Um, so the other question is, what about competing technologies uh, such as uh, SSDs as opposed to disk? So these are very exciting to us also. We're certainly keeping an eye on them. Uh, disk is the uh, mature technology today that uh, is already on every departmental cluster. So in some sense, it's free because they already bought it in advance whether they needed it or not, and it's just sitting there. Um, in terms of SSDs, uh, for the future and other technologies. SSDs, from what I understand today, have a bandwidth that is similar to the bandwidth of disk. You don't really win on the bandwidth side, but where you do win in some sense is on the latency side because SSDs have smaller natural blocks that you're dealing with, uh, and you can access those blocks uh, with, less, uh, with better latency. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, to comment further except to say that this gets rid of the one critical objection that we keep facing in using this as the new RAM uh, in reducing the latency. Uh, so, uh, so this would simply take the algorithmic tricks we have and leverage them still further so that uh, hopefully the coverage and applications would go even further. But it's hard to say more at this stage without actually doing uh, specific experiments. Are there other questions? Well, thank you very much.